A little introduction to the Harris Center. If uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, although I see a lot of familiar names out there, uh, we're a nonprofit organization based in the Monadnock region of Southwest New Hampshire. And we help people fall in love with the natural world through land protection, conservation research, education for all. If you're local, you might be interested in our hiking trails. Um, and we've protected over 25,000 acres of land. Many of those uh, parcels have uh, access that you can, you can go and hike on. Um, so we coordinate conservation research on those lands as well and throughout the region. Um, we have a lot of community programs that we coordinate, including ones like this, and we bring in uh, guest speakers. And we're really excited uh, about tonight's um, speaker. And to introduce that speaker, let me introduce Lisa Murray, our outreach manager. Hello, thank you, Miles. Well, I am so thrilled to introduce to you our speaker of the evening, Francis Morlepe. I first read Diet for a Small Planet, as I said, about 30 years ago. My reaction was similar to many people. The book changed the way I ate. And considering we eat three meals a day, LePay's book has had a profound influence on my life and the lives of so many people literally around the world. It has sold more than 3 million copies. Now in its revised and updated 50th anniversary edition, Diet for a Small Planet makes the connection between how eating a largely plant-centered diet can positively impact not only world hunger, but our own health and the health and survival of the planet itself. Francis is the author or co-author of 20 books, many focusing on the theme of living democracy, a concept I'm sure we'll be discussing this evening. Her most recent book is Daring Democracy, Igniting Power, Meaning, and Connection for the America We Want, co-authored with Adam Eichen. Frances is the recipient of many awards and honorary doctorates, and she is the co-founder of the Small Planet Institute, which she leads with her daughter, Anna Moore LePay. Welcome, Frances. Thank you so much. I am delighted to be here and, and just so impressed by your accomplishments. Thank you so much. We're, we're just so happy that you are here and helping us to kick off an initiative we, we have been doing at the Harris Center called Recipe for a Healthy Planet, which is an online resource and uh, with associated speakers. And you are, are our first and wonderful speaker that we're just absolutely so excited to have. So I had asked for people to submit questions ahead of time. I have a lot of them in my hands. If we have time, um, we'll take questions from the, the audience today. There, you can put them in the chat, as Miles said, but we're gonna launch in um, with the first question. Francis, have you ever imagined the impact that your original one-page handout would spawn? And can you talk a little bit about that journey? Thank you. No, I could not imagine. First of all, I got a C on my first English paper in college. So aspiring to be a writer was never deemed to be possible. It never occurred to me. What happened to me when, uh, well, this was about 1969, um, I, I was just taken by the population bomb, Paul Ehrlich's book. And I was, I, I'd graduated from college and I ended up in Berkeley and my then husband was a postdoc at Berkeley. So I had this opportunity to um, seek, to just explore. And I had access to the agriculture library at Berkeley. And so I thought, oh, 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 I'm lost, but I can find my pathway. And that food is so basic that if I could just understand why there's hunger in the world, that that could open up my vista, you know, it could enable me to find my my journey, my, you know, my life calling. And so I said, okay, is Paul Ehrlich right? And I took my dad's slide rule <laughs> to the library and soon discovered that no, 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 Paul Ehrlich was wrong, that there's more than enough for all of us, but what we are doing is 
creating scarcity from plenty out of many mechanisms that I've been out, you know, been trying to describe to people. But it was not a problem of inadequate supply that the earth, you know, we'd overrun the earth, but it was the economic and political dogma that had led to incredible waste and destruction, as we know, I'm sure all of us here today know about the destruction of the earth's vitality, whether it's destroying the rainforest or uh, just uh, robbing the soil of nutrients through our corporate chemical agriculture. So uh, it was, I just consider myself so fortunate that I had that early time where I could just let, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> that I could just let one question lead to the next. <clears throat> so that was the beginning. I think it's amazing that so much has come out of that. Um, and I think it shows the power that one person can have to make significant change because I'm sure, well, I'm not sure. I mean, did you ever imagine that the impact your work would have. I had read that her first ideas were put down on a one pager and it was really a, a, a publisher. Uh, Francis, it was a publisher who kind of took your one pager and, and encouraged you to turn it into a book. Is that right? Yeah, I started out with a one page handout and then I thought, oh, I should know a little bit more. And it became a little booklet. And then... Uh, <laughs> A friend of mine happened to know the founders of paperback publishing in America, and that is Betty Ballantyne and her husband. And so uh, he sent my little booklet to them. And next thing I knew, Betty Ballantyne wanted to come out and meet me. Actually, she was on the way to Stanford to meet Paul Ehrlich about the population bomb, which is pretty wow. ironic. Yeah. But um, she came out to my house, and I made her one of the recipes. and. When she left, she said, Francis, whoever publishes your book, I will buy it. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I got to connect with Betty before she died a few years ago. And um, I said, um, Betty, what made you take a chance on me? I'd never published anything. And she said, it was your ideas. She said, if you couldn't write it, I could do that. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I was extremely fortunate. And I remember the first day I met Betty as if it were yesterday. Wow, that's great. Well, can you tell us something about the Small Planet Institute that you founded and that uh, your daughter is now part of as well? Mm -hmm. Well, my daughter's on the West Coast, so we, but we're very collaborative. We wrote a book together. Best thing I ever did in my life was to decide to travel on five continents with my daughter and write a book about the world leaders on food sustainability and it changed our lives. So, but um, here in, in Cambridge, I think of our, our small planet institute, which you can see most of in the background, is um, really just asking the next question and a kind of a think and do tank uh, where we um, right now, you know, we've published a number of books. I've written eight books in the last 20 years. Um, and, but we also uh, do public speaking and, um, and shorter pieces, blogs and op-eds and that sort of thing. So um, it's really just a, a vehicle for me to follow my path. And it's been such a blessing. And I'm just consider myself one of the most fortunate people on earth. The young people who come to work as interns in here are just fabulous. And um, so, yeah, we, that's, it's a very small little think tank where we just follow our, our uh, questions, you know, and ask the next question. And where does that take us to the next question? Mm. So that's what Small Planet does. Wonderful to have that freedom to do that. It sounds great. Yes. <laughs> I, I know that I'm extremely fortunate. The concept of democracy has become key in how you frame what actions are possible for individuals or groups to take to address societal or environmental problems. Can you talk about the three intangibles, as you call them, power, meaning, and connection as, the re as they relate to the food choices we make? 
Well, I want to start with the fundamental premise that kind of guides my life, and I'd love your feedback. But I now, especially, it's so great to be 79, and so I can speak with some experience, <laughs> and that and my life experience has taught me that most human beings need three things. We need to feel that we have agency, that we count, that we have power. Power comes from the Latin to be able. We'll say to be able. And it, so power and meaning, we all need meaning in our lives that, that we're not just, not just random acts, but that we have something that's connected to larger than ourselves that gives us meaning. And finally, you know, that that we are working with others, power, meaning, and connection, that we're not alone. And so to me, only democracy in its deepest form can enable human beings to experience power, meaning, and connection, where we know our voices count and it's meaningful that we are working together through our democratic practice to create better life and better connection to our uh, supportive earth and uh, that we are not alone in our practice. And so this idea of living democracy is just to get away from the idea that democracy is just about a particular structure of government or voter turnout and, and tie it and uh, connect it to this deeper uh, meaning, deeper uh, the meaning of life, really. And only democracy enables us to meet those three human needs. Does that make sense to you? That's my philosophy right now. Just to me, and and as you describe it, I I think of the word grassroots. You know, it it it, it literally kind of you know gr it's grounding and it brings it down to that um, where we can all be part of it and we're all needed to be part of it. Exactly, exactly, and and that we're together and that we're together. I one of the smartest thing I ever did was talk about fear of failure. Um, I decided I was going to join a democracy march in 2016 that meant walking 100 miles wow. <laughs> from Philadelphia to Washington and sitting in on the Capitol steps for voting rights, uh, uh, voting rights legislation. And I didn't think I could walk 10 miles, you know, and I thought they'd, you know, they'd be wheeling me off or something. <laughs> but I signed up and I did it. And it was life changing just just that I could do something that I didn't think I could do or I doubted and that I met so many people from so many different walks of life as we walked and talked and walked and talked that I realized that yeah. it wasn't just that so many people and so many ages and backgrounds shared this passion for democracy that it was really life-changing so that's one thing that I'm kind of jumping ahead here but I just want to throw out that uh, Eleanor Roosevelt I love her, and I love this quote. She said, do something every day that scares you. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, and I'm also struck by the fact that you said you're 79, and so 2016, yeah. seven years ago, that at age of 72, you can still do something that's life-changing. So that's a that's a good inspiration for all of us who are experiencing aging. So. <laughs> <laughs> Well, everybody's aging, right? Everybody right, but I mean, you know, in, in the older age category. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, I, you know, and I just love this time when I feel that there's really strong collaboration across generations. I think more so than, than in the past. At least, you know, I experience it that way. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, yeah, that I feel it every day with the young people who come into this office. So it's, it's a great feeling. <laughs> Mm, that's wonderful. Well, in the new 50th anniversary edition introduction of your book, you talk about the 10 food-related assaults on life that have either arisen or, or greatly worsened during the last half century. The second one you mention is how we feed ourselves worsens climate chaos. And the 10th is the overuse of land to produce meat and other destructive farming practices are moving us toward Earth's sixth mass extinction. I know these are huge topics, but can you talk a little bit about each one of those? The second, the second uh, is really, I was so moved by David Attenborough saying that, that we cannot 
solve our relationship with the earth. We can't heal it uh, unless we shift to a plant-centered diet, which frees up so much land to protect biodiversity, to reduce climate chaos, because so many fewer greenhouse gases are emitted. Uh, and he, it was just such a very strong statement. And so I quote him in the opening of Diet for a Small Planet, the new diet, and, and really try to bring that so real to people that that how much our diets are now connected to um, the biggest challenges of this time. I, I, I In the new diet, I talk about um, um, the estimate that if even if we just move to a Mediterranean diet, um, that is, you know, less meat on the side and not at the center, that that alone would be the equivalent in terms of reducing greenhouse gas emissions that would be equivalent to taking all vehicles off the road, planes and ships away. You know, it would have that much impact. So huh. that was a piece of the puzzle that I didn't, you know, really address, of course, in it wasn't at the center of our consciousness when I began and that it's become so, so urgent. And then the biodiversity piece that we're now learning, you know, that the, the destruction of rainforest, for example, in the Amazon uh, for grazing is threatening biodiversity. And that's what David Attenborough was really focusing on. It's just the, the, the biodiversity is being destroyed because of this fixation. And that uh, is very much a product of our economic and political paradigm, which I can go into, but uh, all of it has to be addressed <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. in which we become to see ourselves as um, all of us as having a voice and taking responsibility for, for healing our relationship to the earth. Thank you. Your first foray into the topic of food was to address hunger amid plenty. And now, as you say, it's evolved into essentially saving the planet. The stakes have gotten much higher. Is it possible to boil your message down to one or two concrete action steps that individuals can take? And what can we do to bring more attention to the connections between diet and the planet? Well, it's pretty straightforward. <laughs> um, it's um, as much as we possibly can to uh, eat foods that uh, are not processed either, you know, we, um, because that, of course, requires energy and are not processed through animals in particular because that greatly diminishes the capacity to feed us. And so the more we can eat in the plant world and the more we can eat unprocessed foods, the healthier we are and the healthier the planet. And it's just tragic that we've seen the processed foods being now spread through the global south and people developing the same diseases we have here. I talked to a doctor in India who said that, you know, he used to treat people who didn't get enough calories and were sick because of that. And now he said, it's diabetes. These same, the same mm -hmm. communities that used to have too few calories are now exposed to processed food and therefore they're getting diabetes. And when my daughter and I wrote our book, Hope's Edge, and we traveled in rural India, we'll never forget going in very, very back roads, you know, and seeing trees with Pepsi, Pepsi ads mm -hmm. painted on the trees. Right, it's just so disturbing. Um, the 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 this radical change in diet that we, has happened. We're also exporting the idea that uh, there's prestige in eating a meat based diet, aren't we? For you know, wealthier people around other parts of the world that were plant centered are now going more toward meat. It's like going backwards. Right, very good. In terms of environmentally. Yeah. Right. And so anything and everything that we can do to embody this healthier message uh, and to motivate people to feel good, it's not about sacrifice. I mean, mm -hmm. that's the 
frame I want to drop. It's not about, oh, I'm going to sacrifice, but how can I explore this wondrous world? That's where the variety course is, is in the plant world. All the fruits and vegetables and grains and legumes, and it's, it's endless. And, and the combinations you can come up with, that is what most struck me when I first made this shift. People said, oh, how can you give up? meat. And I said, oh, I'm not giving up. I'm, I'm expanding. I'm embracing all this world of plant foods that growing up in Texas, by the way, the nickname for the city I grew up in is Cowtown. Ah. <laughs> Fort Worth, Texas. <laughs> yeah, ironic, right? Wow. Yes, indeed. Well, w one of my questions was going to be, it seems that many people resist embracing the idea that what they eat can indeed be a powerful force in the world. Why do you think it's so hard for people to accept and act on this? And you've just been referring to that partly. I mean, that it's a very interesting point that people tend to think of it as giving up instead of like, right. it's a new thing. It's a new uh, an exciting new whole palette to explore lots of things that you you may not normally have combined or put together um have you seen a lot of change in the past 50 years since the first edition of the book came out in terms of how many people are embracing a plant a plant based diet do you find that people are more or less apt to to explore or you know, what's your general sense of, of what the pulse of the American population is? Well, I think it's a huge shift, a huge shift. I mean, just where I am here in Harvard Square, when I first started working in this area, I mean, there was no place I could, I don't think there was any place that was highlighting its plant-based offerings. And now there are probably four uh, that I can go to within a few not not many feet from here. Uh, one has a particularly yummy mushroom burger. That I love. <laughs> uh, but it's just an enormous change. I mean, there's almost any restaurant I go to, at least in this area, where there's not, you know, at least one or two really great veggie options for a main dish. You know, that's just the norm here. I don't, maybe I live in a bubble now, but I don't know about going back to Fort Worth, Texas and what I would get, but um, <laughs> I, I've just seen enormous change here just in the, you know, I've been working in this area for uh, about 20 years and I've just seen this huge change. That's good. That's hopeful. Um, one question that, that was um, submitted to me was that approximately half the U.S. population wanted to believe that COVID was not a serious issue, ditto for climate change. What hope or strategy can we have to win over half of the United States, let alone the rest of the world? It's a big question. but <laughs> Well, yeah, that's a huge question. Um, I, you know, I, I, I start from the assumption that most people want to feel their lives have meaning and that they're part of the solution, not the problem. And so the more that we can communicate, not, oh, you're a bad guy, but that, wow, this is exciting. We have a challenge and you can be part of the solution uh, in all the ways that you can, you know, and one way is food. And of course, um, renewable energy is another and uh, figuring out, you know, just even using public transportation, if um, if it's at all possible, rather than in, you know adding one more car on the road, I mean, just it feels good to feel part of the solution, and I think that's the the framing. And I think too often people who are concerned about these issues as we are can feel like scolds, you know, can feel like, oh, you bad person, you're part of the problem, rather than, oh, this is really great to be feeling part of the solution. Mm -hmm. So that's what I try to do. I don't know if I always succeed, but that's what, you know, that motivates me and all of my work. And um, so that's, yeah, I think the more that we can do that. Thank you. Um, you talk in the book about rubbing elbows with the experts. Can you talk about the self-doubt that we might be carrying around as individuals and how each individual is actually 
more powerful than they might imagine, as you have certainly shown in your life, that's for sure. Yeah, I think hmm, that starting out with the assumption that someone is always watching, you know, this is again about the worldview that we're all connected. And from moment to moment, whether our family, friends, colleagues at work, someone is always watching and uh, and noticing too. <laughs> and so every act we take, yes, it, you know, when I choose a plant-centered diet, I'm sending those signals back through the economy that I want more of that and less of this grain-fed meat. But you too uh, know that Others are watching you and we're all molding ourselves from on each other moment to moment. And so in the sense that we're all connected, everything is in continuous change, then it's not possible to know what's possible. So that that frees me to just not be so concerned since it's not possible to know what's possible in such a world, then I'm free to go for the world that I want and knowing that that I'm going to make ripples and I don't know how big they'll be. I don't know who I might influence, but you never know. You might influence someone who then goes on to influence millions. You don't know. Mm -hmm. And I just find that so freeing, um, along with Eleanor Roosevelt, do with something every day that scares you. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it <laughs> certainly <laughs> seems to be a, a recipe for cultivating hope. Yes, yes. I, I've been... Um, my my uh, my twitter handle is hope monger <laughs> <laughs> and uh i try to live up to that um uh, you know it, it can be tough at times i'm i'm writing a, a new book called tough truths <laughs> mm -hmm. for a better tomorrow about where our democracy really ranks in the world and i have to really keep remembering that i'm the hope monger <laughs> <laughs> sounds good i look forward to reading that well, many in, in the medical profession think that vegetarians or vegans do not get enough protein, calories, or vitamins. I mean, many in the general population, but even in the medical profession um, where they're influencing people more with their knowledge or lack thereof. And how do we combat that? And and can you talk a little bit about the the, the protein, which is a lot of yeah. people's concern about being plant-centered. You know, I don't see that nearly what I used to. And I know at the Harvard Medical School, there are people who are saying the opposite, you know, that, that first of all, uh, Americans eat twice the protein that their bodies can use. So I want everybody to understand we don't store protein in our bodies. And so if we don't use it, um, as protein, it just gets used as energy, just as carbs. Uh, so there's no point in eating more than we can use. And on average, Americans eat twice what they need. So um, there really is nothing to be concerned about, about moving to a plant-centered diet in terms of getting enough protein. It's just not an issue. Um, and we also know that as we consciously move into a plant-centered plant world, we're eating more of the variety of, you know, in the world of of um, of uh, grains and legumes and veggies and fruit that that we're getting all these these micronutrients and vitamins and in ways that we don't if we're just in a usual kind of meat centered and maybe a potato on the side kind of thing. So um, I've just discovered the opposite. You know that uh, in fact, when I first wrote Diet for a Small Planet, I had people come to me and said, "Oh, thank you because." you created peace in my family because my parents were convinced that I would die if I of protein deficiency if I didn't eat meat. So I think that's really dissolving because um, it's just not, I, I deal with it in uh, Diet for a Small Planet, it's just not an issue. If we eat a healthy, um, if we eat healthfully and, and don't eat processed, <laughs> I mm -hmm. mean, that's the, that's the harm today is not the key medical harm in our diet is processed foods uh, that um, are devoid of real nutrients and are full of uh, salt and sugar and and uh, and um, not healthy oil. So um, I, I just celebrate a plant-centered diet for health reasons uh, as well as 
planetary reasons. And so actually I've started calling myself a planetarian instead of a vegetarian. I love that. Well, I in talking about processed foods, I think so many people eat on the run these days or just don't take the time to prepare meals and and perhaps eat together. Um, but so many people eating on the run. And what's your sense of uh, the the commitment to be more plant centered, given the pace of our world and the fact that you know people are eating drive in drive bys, mm -hmm. you know, or 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 container foods. How, how do you? How can you? Um, What's a what's a good way to 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 fight that I guess or or to just uh, a tactic to take to help people to be able to still eat healthfully in a very fast paced world? Yeah, well, I think in the new diet, but other places, you know, that some of it is pretty simple. Um, you know, um, I always say that one tool in the kitchen is to have a, a pressure cooker because that speeds up the cooking time for uh, raw foods like um, beans and um, grains. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it saves energy because it cooks faster. And um, so a pressure cooker is handy, but also just to cook more than you need for any given meal, like beans and rice, you can do in so many different fashions. You could have beans and rice frozen if you wanted and pull them out and you, you can go in the Latin direction of adding, you know, um, adding, um, you know, uh, more spicy Latin herbs and, and spices and or you could go in the Italian route and, and uh, add veggies that you associate with that. And you could keep but keep those basic things ready to combine. So I think that's one avenue um and just find a, some key recipes that your family likes and that you just have in your head <laughs> so you don't have to look at a recipe book and and uh make more of those and again freeze the whole thing so you always have some ready to serve and i think um that that really helps a lot and uh just i know uh yeah that um, yeah. Great. Yeah, I know I, I personally do a ton of freezing of cooked beans or leftovers. I love leftovers and put them in a little glass jar and then I could pull one out for lunch or whatever. So it, it is learning how to eat a different way. And like you said earlier, embracing that opportunity to learn something new and it can be exciting. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned the glass containers because my daughter, bless her heart, a year ago when she was staying with me, she went out and got me the coolest little jars and different sizes and everything that just help a lot in terms of uh, always having something the right size to uh, store uh, leftovers. And um, so I really encourage that investment too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, the recipes in your book are mostly vegetarian. Do you think the aim should be for being vegan in terms of the planet, or is being vegetarian a significant enough impact for those who would have a difficult time going in the vegan direction? Oh, gosh, I don't really take much of a position. I mean, to me, if we move away from grain-fed meat that is so wasteful and destructive, of, you know, from biodiversity to water pollution, um, that is so huge that um, I think that's the, and I'm not a vegan, I do eat cheese. So not much, but I do. <laughs> and um, so uh, I celebrate those who go all the way. I certainly do, yay for you. But I, I, um, I really encourage any move we can make in, in this direction of um, less grain-fed meat. Um, and it's not just, one of the things I wanted to point out that I just learned for writing the 50th anniversary edition that, um, you know, 
this grain-fed meat centered diet has created an agricultural system here that is not just wasteful, but it is so damaging that the, the pesticide um, and uh, fertilizer runoff into the Mississippi River uh, creates a um, dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico that is now the size of Massachusetts. Oof. And so our, you know, remember when you're choosing a plant-centered um, organic, hopefully as much organic as we can, that you are taking that great harm away as well. I mean, I just, it's devastating to think about that, um, this dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico, the size of Massachusetts and all the, the sea life we're, we're um, harming is, is just um, something that most people don't think about when they choose uh, veggies, but it's very important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, you've spoken a little bit about um, how you cultivate hope, and um, you've certainly kept your drive going for years and years and years and years, which is really remarkable. Are there a couple of examples, uh, hopeful anecdotes? You've traveled the world, you've seen a lot of, met a lot of people, a lot of different cultures. Is, is there anything that stands out for you that you'd like to share with us? tell you one story well there's so many so many but uh one I shall ne never ever forget is being in southern India and I was at a big international climate conference and I said oh but I'm near this village that started this movement called the Deccan Development Society these poor women who moved away from chemical agriculture and created these their farms organically and, and that's began to spread around the world. I've got to go visit these women. And so I got into a taxi and I got out to the village and it's called, again, you can look it up, Deccan Development Society. And they they sat around on their straw mat with me and each told their story. And they said, 20 or so years ago, we were all hungry. We had no power vis-a-vis -vis our husbands, vis-a-vis -vis the village community, we had no power but we started meeting every week in our homes after our children were in bed and we each contributed a little bit of money and collected it and then allowed one of us to get a little bit of land. And we moved away from monoculture of white rice and we started planting a variety of nutritious crops. And now uh, it just I just tear up thinking about it. Their model has spread is spreading around the world, but. As I was leaving the village that day, and after they had described to me the incredible accomplishment of how much change they had um, succeeded in achieving, and oh, by the way, they even got their own radio station to <laughs> spread the word about their work um, in organic agriculture and, and the, the rewards to all of them. And they said to me, and I started walking out, and I heard this rustle of sound behind me, and they were rushing up the hill. And I turned around and stopped, of course, and they ran up and they said, we forgot to tell you the most important thing. The most important thing is that we found our courage. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I just thought that was so beautiful because they had felt like as women, they had no voice. As uh, the lowest caste women, they had people, they had no voice. And they found their courage to just say, forget it. We're doing this. We're going for it. And um, so that is one story that I keep with me as if it were yesterday. I can hear the sound of the women and their voices rushing after me. Wait, wait, wait. And, um, you know, I could go on about the landless workers movement in Brazil that Anna and I visited um, that risked their lives and some lost their lives to take unused land that had been in the hands of the 1% of Brazilian landowners who controlled half the land in the country. And they had taken this land just moved on to it and started growing food organically. And now they, they're they benefiting, I think, 170,000 families. So there's so much, so much, excuse me, so much uh, that we can learn. I could go on and on, but um, so I think it's so important that each of us find um, uh, examples that inspire us. And I, I know a gentleman named Jules Preddy 
I've been following his work and he, he, up until the year 2000, he had tracked about a half a million sustainable small farms, you know, um, organic farms around the world. And then after 2000 up to um, 2020, he found 8 million more. It has exploded, uh, that trend. And I think the more we can just expose ourselves and read about what um, – these good things that are happening that aren't in the newspaper, aren't on the web, you know, that that we don't run into and um, and really look for the good news stories because we all model ourselves after each other and hope is absolutely essential. Well, you know, you mentioned the women um, having a radio station at, at this point in the first story and um that's amazing and and fantastic. It's like part of what hits me is like, how do you like you write books that sell millions? <laughs> but like for the average person, how do we how do we help spread the the effort to help people understand how their food choices can have an impact? You know, um, what's the best way the common person can do that? I really, you know, I think I've said this, but I think it to recognize that every time we interact with others, we're influencing them that that just by your choice to choose, you know, the, the plant centered eating and invite your friends over and what do you think? And let's try this recipe and talk about it in your church group or your women's group or your workplace or, you know, as as a joy, not a you should, but it's a joy. Mm -hmm. Look what I've discovered. And by the way, it's cheaper, <laughs> and um, and you know it lasts longer. Da, 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 da. So, but I, I think that we to recognize that we're all influencers, all of us. Yeah, I'm so fortunate that I happened to meet Betty Valentine, and she published this book just as when she did, and gave me a platform. I get it. But all of us are influencers in our families, in our friendship groups, in our community groups, our church groups, our synagogues, you know, that we have to recognize that, that we all are influencers. So we shouldn't think that we are powerless in that sense of, it's just, well, we know that every time we shop and buy something that that does send signals back through the economy to, you know, we want more of that. But in addition, somebody else is watching us, you know, our friends and our family. So mm -hmm. we are all influencers. We are all have power. Um, sort of tangentially to that, how can we how can we respond to those who care yet feel, feel things are so bad that nothing we do makes a difference? I mean, it's kind of goes in line with what you're saying. I guess we just we keep putting it out there. Um, I mean, I personally know people who are like, oh, it. it you know, nothing I do is going to make a difference. So, you know, let, let's just do whatever we want because one person can't make a, can't make a change, you know, can't, can't stop the tide. Well, I, you know, I, I'll repeat this theme of in a world of continuous change in which we're all connected, that it is impossible to know what's possible. Mm -hmm. And to think that, um, we know that, you know, we're certainly, we're certain that somehow it's all going to end no matter what. I think that is the ultimate hubris, you know, that, um, that we, we already, you know, we have proof of how we can reduce greenhouse gas emissions and, and other countries are doing so much better than we are at that. And, um, there's no reason why there's, why we can't do so much better than we are um, because other countries that are also industrial countries are doing so much better. I, I, I wrote a book that, that you can just download from our website called It's Not Too Late, mm. um, where I, I compare our, in part what it is, is showing what other countries are doing on climate change and how much we could, better we could do or in that, in that regard. And so, um, you know, that um, that's what they prove that it's possible. 
these are capitalist economies like ours, and yet they're still doing so much better, a number of them. So um, I, I really uh, encourage people to read that. Um, it's not too late. It, I found that so encouraging to uh, write it. Wonderful. I'll certainly download it. Um, what are some of your favorite plant-based recipes and how did you go about starting to um, explore the plant world more? What's been the most exciting part? Well, I don't really have a favorite. Um, I guess I was just thinking, what did I make for the last time I had somebody over to dinner and I made um, an eggplant parmesan. <laughs> so it's not vegan by any means, but um, I just love the combo of, uh, of grilled eggplant that I then layer in with Parmesan and, and um, you know, lasagna noodles and, and um, tomato sauce and Parmesan and eggplant. And it's just really, everybody loves it. <laughs> so uh, that's one. But I also like just stir frying uh, any kind of veggie. Um, chopped veggies, as long as you get some onions in there and really get them, <laughs> uh, really get them well cooked. But, you know, just any variety of veggies that you have in the refrigerator and combine that with some brown rice and some, you know, either lentils or um, black beans or whatever your favorites are. And, and you know, take that either in a Latin direction or an Italian direction. I said earlier, you know, that that it's just so simple and uh, it's so easy to store. So I think um uh yeah i i just try to think of there's a yes. wonderful um vegan restaurant here in the in cambridge called red lentil mm. and they make this amazing um uh dish where they just take um cauliflower and um, bread it slightly and deep fry it and it's just to die for it so mm. delicious so there's so many great recipes. And I also I think, recommend Molly Katzen's books. Uh, she's a friend and, you know, Moosewood Cookbook. Uh, there's so, she's just such an artist in the kitchen. At this point in your life, do you use, um, do you cook mostly freestyle? Do you use recipes or combination or um, is it just second nature at this point? Yeah, it's freestyle. Yeah, I, I, um, it's pretty funny, I have to admit. So uh, I'm embarrassed to say I wrote a cookbook, but I don't use one. <laughs> we'll keep your secret. <laughs> okay, thank you. It's not beyond this call. Well, Miles, um, we have a few minutes here. Uh, we could take some questions from the audience here if people want to put them in the chat. Yeah, well, oh, I think you were frozen for a minute. <laughs> we don't have any any questions right now, but um, I do have the website up. If uh, if Francis wanted to walk us through the Small Planet Institute website, fantastic, that'd be great. And right now, I've got it. Um, oh, there! It's not too late. The, it's not too late. I shared that in the chat with everybody, so they should be able to uh, find that link pretty easy. Crisis, opportunity, and the power of hope. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, thank you. And then let's see what's um, we're uh, right right now. We're working on a report, um, uh, and uh, it's not out yet, but it will be out in the next few months. And it's going to be called "Tough Truths for a Better Tomorrow," and really talking about where the U.S. ranks internationally on a number of issues. But um, yeah, I was just in a in an event in Minneapolis and was signing some of these other books. And if you scoot back up to the top, I just want to mention a couple uh, that this You Have the Power book was really selling. <laughs> and it's all about using fear as energy but the publisher would not let us put fear in the title. This is the red book down, down, down 
uh, you have the power. It's what's so funny is the publisher said Americans are too afraid to buy a book about fear. <laughs> so they made us put this title in it. But I love this book that I wrote with this dear friend, Jeffrey Perkins. And it's all about turning fear into energy for positive energy. And so I, I have this kind of cheesy recommendation, but it really works for me. Uh, it, I'll, anyway, that when I feel that pounding heart of fear, right? I say, no, 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 Frankie. That's my nickname. No, 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 Frankie. Uh, that just is your inner applause. That's your inner applause telling you that you're doing exactly the right thing. And so it's 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 a book about transforming fear into positive energy. <laughs> Wonderful. I, I have a question here. You spoke a little bit about how other countries are are doing compared with us. What do you have a sense of who is the the most progressive? Where are the most progressive countries with respect to food choices and plant centered diets? Is it the European countries? Is it uh, you know, Southern, what, Southern Hemisphere? You know, I'm not, I've been looking uh, today in particular at the project is is more on the quality of their democracy mm -hmm. than the food angle. Uh, but uh, certainly I do know in, in, um, in preparing speeches on, uh, on the food and farming piece of my life that, uh, the Netherlands is a standout, uh, for example. Sweden is a standout in the sense of the government of the Netherlands has come together with the um, food industry to make more and more of uh, the Dutch diet plant-based, and it's a conscious strategy. So I was really impressed with that, and I'd love to go visit and see how that's mm. going. Um, mm -hmm. So that is an example of a leadership that is really remarkable to me. Wonderful. And even, even I want to say, even in Brazil, I just included in this last speech that, you know, you think of Brazil as a big meat country, right? Yeah. And that the, num the, the number of vegetarians have doubled over the last short period in Brazil. So it's not just a Western quote unquote, industrial countries kind of thing, that it's really a discussion going on around the world. Yeah. That's encouraging. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's a question, Miles, in the chat, if you want to read that about food cooperatives. Oh, yeah, Suzette. Um, she says, all that Francis talks about is so reson resonant with uh, our cooperatives with what our cooperatives are all about. It's uh, heartening to hear about communities organizing new food co-ops in recent years. One uh, about to open in Maynard, Massachusetts, and one organizing just outside of Boston, the Charles River Food. Uh, Francis, do you know about those co-ops? And I don't, I don't, but I'm I'm such a fan of cooperatives. It's, it's at the heart of all of my work of the democracy that is, doesn't stop, it doesn't begin and end at the ballot box. It's throughout our lives having voice and cooperatives are an economic uh, expression of that. And I know, you know, when I was beginning diet, I was Diet for Small Planet. I was definitely shopping at the Berkeley Co-op. And um, mm -hmm. right now there's no co-op right that's uh, convenient, shall we say, to where I am, but um, I, um, I'm glad that you mentioned it because I could go, I could go more out of my way than I have been to still shop at the co-op I used to shop at before I moved. So um, thank you for that reminder. And I just praise anyone who is supporting the cooperative movement because it is, it is our fulfillment of our, our democratic culture in economic life. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much. I think we're just about um, at at the hour mark. And I just want to say how wonderful it was to have you and what an inspiration you are and have been, certainly for me personally, for literally decades. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I hope you can tell how much fun I've had. I think I've had a smile on my face all the time because 
it's just so thrilling for me to have this opportunity and all of you out there, thank you for participating.